Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. My name is Daniel Jean, and I am a distinguished fellow for the Canada School of Public Service. I am pleased to be the moderator for today's event on the future of democracy. First, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am and where the production is, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Chabé people. I recognize that our participants are from various parts of the country and therefore you may work on a different indigenous territory. I encourage you to take a moment to think about the territory you occupy. I'm now pleased to introduce today's event entitled National Identity and the Challenges of Democratic Cooperation which is the third event in the Future of Democracy series. We have a great discussion planned for you today and I want you to have the best possible experience. Therefore, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. First of all, today's event is in English, but there is simultaneous interpretation as well as the service of real-time captioning that is available if you wanna follow in the language of your choice. So just look at the signal on your screen. To access these features, please click on their respective icons directly from the webcast interface, and you can refer to the reminder email that was sent to you by the School of Public Service. To optimize your viewing experience, we recommend that you disconnect from your VPN or use a personal device to watch the session when possible. If you are experiencing technical issues, it's recommended to relaunch the webcast link provided to you. During the event, you may submit your questions at any time, by pressing the raise and icon located at the top right hand corner of your screen. We've planned some time for a question and answer period at the end of the session. And in fact, uh, we're just talking to speakers and we're gonna try to make even more time available. Now, without further ado, we'll start today's event with a presentation by Francesca Paletta, Chancellor's Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. We gotta thank Francesca to be uh, here so early for her because it's seven o'clock in the morning in California. Her research interests include social movements, democracy, culture, gender, and social theory. Her new book, Inventing the Ties That Bind Imagine Relationships in Moral and Political Life, is forthcoming. So here's a short introduction by Francesca on the importance of cooperation in the futures of democracy. Francesca? Hi, my name is Francesca Poletta. I'm Chancellor's Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. And I'm grateful to the Monk School for giving me this opportunity to think through with you the challenges of cooperation in modern democracies. So let me begin with the fact that democracy demands a lot of its citizens. It requires us to obey laws we may not want to, to vote even when we're busy, to accept the election of leaders that we didn't personally vote for and the adoption of policies that we may not agree with. It requires us to recognize the rights of people we may not like and through our tax dollars to support people who are in need, even if we can't imagine ourselves ever being in those circumstances. The question then, and it is one that scholars across disciplines wrestle with, as well as people in the trenches of government, is how to secure that cooperation. Certainly, you can offer people incentives to participate, appeal to their self-interest. You can appeal to their fear of punishment for not cooperating. You can build their trust that their democratic institutions are fair. Now, each one of these makes sense, but as prescriptions for strengthening democratic solidarity, they're either fairly self-evident, yes, making institutions fairer increases people's trust that those institutions are fair ones, or they're surprisingly unpredictable in their effects. Just to give one example, uh, research shows that when people are offered incentives to cooperate, they tend to cooperate only as long as they're offered the incentives. After that, even people who would have cooperated in the absence of the incentives stop cooperating. It's not that they're greedy. It's that they assume that everyone else was cooperating all along only because of the incentives. So self-interest, trust, 
a respect for the roles, all of these matter. But something else seems to matter too. Citizens' love for the nation. People's willingness to cooperate in a democracy may depend on that mushy, hard to explain, hard to even conceptualize sense of national identity. Canadian democracy works in this view because of your sense of Canadianness. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Now, there is abundant social psychological evidence for the motivating power of group identity generally and national identity in particular. Once you put people into groups and the basis for the group can be fairly minimal. Uh, the earliest experimental studies assigned people to groups simply based on which modern painter they preferred. But once people see themselves as members of a group, they act to support the group, even when it is not in their self-interest to do so. They don't have to know each other personally to feel that sense of group loyalty, only that others are members of the group to which they feel emotionally attached. And in this vein, uh, the historian Benedict Anderson famously referred to nations as imagined communities. You will never know a fraction of the members of the nation, and yet you feel that there is something that binds you to one another. The bonds are fictional, but the feelings are real. And those feelings motivate democratic cooperation. Um, Research shows that people with a strong sense of national identity pay more attention to politics, they vote more, they trust fellow citizens more, they're more willing to make sacrifices for the nation, and uh, they're more likely to support redistributive policies, that is government policies that support the needy. There's a hitch though. Research also shows that people who identify strongly with the nation tend to be biased in their assessment of economic conditions and political leaders. In other words, they vote more, but their voting tends to be less well-informed. They are less likely to trust immigrants, and they are often less likely to support redistribution to people in need. So which is it? <laughs> Is national identity good or bad for democratic cooperation? Or perhaps better, when is it which? What seems to be important is not only the strength of one's identification with the nation, but the content of that identification. It depends on what you believe being Canadian means. Now, of course, it means many things. But studies show that people who emphasize inherited, unchosen traits in their definition of national membership, traits like ethnicity, race, religion, people who define, for example, being truly American as being white, Northern European, and Christian, these people tend to be hostile to immigration, hostile to minority rights, and hostile to government support for those in need. And the reason may be that this way of thinking about the nation um, is based on a myth of ethnic ancestry, that we're all figuratively or really descended from the same group. I think you can see that that sense of imagined kinship uh, would produce solidarity but also that it might make it easy to see people who came later to the nation or who were already here or who for other reasons are simply more difficult to see as family seem also less deserving. Some scholars have argued then that democratic cooperation depends not on an ethnic conception of nationhood, but on a civic one. What joins, us, what joins us is not that we share the same origins, not that we're something like family, but rather that we share the same values. And so to promote democratic cooperation, we simply need to remind people of those national values. 
Being Canadian in this view means being committed to equality and diversity and freedom and human rights. Being American means being committed to equality and diversity and freedom and human rights. Being Guatemalan means being committed to equality and diversity and freedom and human rights. I think you can see the problem here. Conceptualizing the nation in terms of its values doesn't do much to distinguish this nation from other democratic nations. It doesn't foster the kind of loyalty to the group that a notion of nation as kinship does. We're not even a group in this view. We're just people who happen to believe the same things that people in many other democracies believe. This then I think is the challenge. Can we foster an understanding of the we that is thick in the sense of emotionally compelling, that gives us that sense of groupness, but a groupness that is inclusive rather than exclusive? Now, at a time in the United States when our democracy seems close to the brink, uh, the challenge has become an urgent one. And in my own research, I've been intrigued by what has become a popular answer to that challenge. Uh, today, there are countless initiatives that bring together people across the divide to talk to one another, bring together Democrats and Republicans, Muslims and Christians, white Americans and black Americans, bring them together to share their stories, to listen empathetically with the idea that the mutual understanding and even friendship that is formed in these encounters will spiral outward to create the broader solidarities that we seem to lack. Now, I have a lot to say about these initiatives, um, but my main concern is that just how intimate conversations among a few people who want to talk to one another will somehow create broader solidarities among a vast number of people who have no interest in talking to one another isn't clear. If imagined kinship isn't an adequate basis for democratic cooperation, I'm not convinced that real friendships are either. The community of the nation must be imagined, I think, and it must include people who are not our intimates and will never be our intimates. But here's the key, and here's where I do see promise. Family and friendship are not the only two relationships with which most of us have experience. We have relationships as co-workers and as colleagues and as neighbors and as hosts and guests. We cooperate in these relationships, but we do so in a different way than we do with friends and family. We cooperate by way of reciprocity rather than altruism, equality rather than communal sharing, fair procedure rather than intimacy. And so what if we imagined the national community not as kin or as friends, but rather as people who cooperate for a common purpose? Yes, that purpose may be to enact shared values. We're back to the civic conception of nationhood. But what matters is less the values than the relationships that are needed to enact those values. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In 2002, social psychologists Kyung Lee and Marilyn Brewer had research subjects, all American, uh, read one of two statements. One group read that the 9-11 attacks had united Americans by reminding them, and I'm quoting here, what we have in common as Americans, the core essence of what it means to be American, end quote. The other group read a slightly different statement, that 9-11 had united Americans rem by reminding them of, quote, a common purpose to fight terrorism in all its forms and to work together, end quote. 
Then both groups were asked their views of policies around immigration and minority rights. People in the first group who were primed to think about their Americanness as a kind of fundamental and timeless essence tended to oppose policies supporting immigrants and minorities. In fact, the stronger their sense of national identity, the stronger their opposition. But people in the second group who were primed to think that what joined them was the importance of their working together rather than their common essence expressed more tolerant views, even when they scored high on markers of national identity. In other words, how subjects imagined the bonds that joined them led them to support more or less inclusive policies. And I want to note that these ways of thinking about the group were not new to research subjects. People were familiar with both conceptions of their Americanness. The more inclusive conception simply had to be primed. And so the question that I ask is, how do we do that priming in real life? How do we get people to think about the ties that make up the national community as ones of cooperation rather than as ones of sameness or kinship? I don't know the answer to that, um, but in thinking about it, I've come to see Canada's policies of multiculturalism in a somewhat different way than I used to. Canada, you may know, is one of the few countries where a strong sense of national identity is associated with support for immigration rather than opposition to it. Again, one of the very few countries in which that's the case. And one explanation uh, that scholars have advanced plausibly is that pride in multiculturalism is a part of Canadian national identity, that being Canadian means in part to support multiculturalism. But what strikes me about Canada's multicultural policies is not so much the abstract value of diversity they promote as the work those policies require to actually accommodate difference, not just to celebrate difference, to accommodate it. The work that policymakers and administrators and advocacy groups and employers and ordinary citizens do to figure out, for example, just when a commitment to difference uh, threatens a commitment to equality and what to do about it. To negotiate minor controversies as much as major ones. Some years ago, Will Kimlicka made the point that already multiculturalism in Canada had become banal. He meant banal not in the sense of stupid or trivial, but rather that it had, it had become the task of everyday politics. Perhaps that was made easier by the fact that Canadians have never been able to operate on the myth of a single people. But one of the things that that everyday politics of multiculturalism is doing, it seems to me, is figuring out in a very practical way what cooperative relationships across difference should look like. Multiculturalism, and again, not the value so much as how that value was put into practice, models a distinctive kind of political belonging in which the negotiation of our differences is what joins us. It's negotiation that is time-consuming, difficult, sometimes tiresome, but in a democracy is unavoidable. Indeed, is what democracy is. So let me conclude with three tentative observations. One, that we can imagine our co-nationals in different ways, um, not only as something like family, but also as something like collaborators, neighbors, hosts and guests, stewards of a common inheritance, 
there are likely others. Relationships that emphasize cooperation rather than sameness. Two, that these alternative ways of imagining the ties that bind can be communicated by culture, by the stories we tell, by the histories we learn, but also by way of the policies we enact. They too send a message about how we are joined. And three, that that work of imagination may be essential to democracy. So let me stop there and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca. A lot of food for thought there. Are three key takeaways that you want us to focus on, the importance of cooperation, the fact that these ties can also be communicated both by stories, but also by policies that are enacted. And the fact that imagination is important. In fact, you say it's essential. Uh, we're gonna have a chance to further to uh, Francesca in a few minutes, but let me now introduce Ron Levy. He's the professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy the Department of Sociology, and he's a distinguished professor of global justice. He holds a courtesy cross appointment to the Faculty of Law, and he's a permanent visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen. Wang works at the intersection of political sociology and the sociology of law. In fact, he was just uh, before the uh, session talking to us about some work he's doing, some research work he's doing on uh, policing and, and uh, in uh, marginalized racialized uh, communities. Ron, uh, let's give you a chance to have a quick reaction before we get into um, a more uh, interactive panel. Go ahead, Ron. So thank you, Danielle, and thank you, everybody uh, who's there out there. Um, I hear a lot of people are out there in this audience, so it's wonderful uh, to have this opportunity and to be here with uh, Francesca Poletta, who I should say is a is a colleague and friend, but also, um, frankly, someone I, I've been reading for a long time. So to be able to be on the panel with Francesca is a, is a real treat. So, I mean, that's an amazing uh, talk for me, Francesca, and and I want to I want to both congratulate you on it, but push you on it, right? Because in its core, um, this is a story you're telling about how, at least as I hear it, it's not all the idea of family, kin. It's not all the idea of friendship, uh, close relationships. It's also cooperation and that we have experience, as I heard you say it, with uh, ways of being in interaction with each other through cooperation, even without deep, thick emotional attachments. Um, but that puts a lot, I think, on that moment of cooperation. And so I wanna raise um, three tension points uh, with that. And maybe they're not contradictory. I hope they're not, I don't think they are, but I think, I think it forces us to think through three other dimensions. Um, the first is at the level, let's call it of the state, right? Of, uh, of the state's ideas about itself and about the nation, right? And so, um, if we think of you know, Canada as uh, having multicultural policies, uh, for example, uh, other countries having other uh, personalities or ideas of themselves that are put out through policy, right? Uh, Vanessa Barker in Sweden talks about Swedish ideas of the welfare state that are enacted uh, through policy, for example. Um, to what extent uh, do those vary and can they fuel or detract from that cooperation? Right, so I guess I'm saying here, let's not put it all at the feet of you and me, uh, or you, me, and Danielle, who have to go out and cooperate now. What's the level of policy here that matters, right? Uh, and how does it matter? The, the second question I have about this, and this is, I think we're really alert to it over the past several years, both south of the border uh, and elsewhere, including in Canada, uh, is the question of politicians. Um, so aside from the state, uh, the bureaucracy, the, the policy field, the sort of political speeches, the narratives of politics, right? Um, and to what extent are these ideas of cooperation um, commensurate with what's happening recently in politics? And maybe it's not that recent, but what's happening uh, in political speeches? The last one I'll, I'll say is that as individuals, we come to this uh, cooperative possibility with pasts, collective pasts, um, 
sometimes from countries of migration, um, and sometimes from neighborhoods in which we live. Uh, Danielle was saying, I'm working on policing. Uh, so in the context of cities like Baltimore and Cleveland, where I've been doing a lot of interview work, uh, these are cities rife with tension uh, with the police. The experience of policing is not only uh, at my interaction with the state, it's where I live. It's the stories that are told around me about the state and about others, uh, to use your language. And um, so to what extent uh, are being nested in those neighborhoods or in those pasts, I'm not sure how to think about it, um, relevant to thinking about cooperation as a mode of doing the nation um, for you? So those are my, my three questions. Um, I don't know if they're questions uh, so much as just thought bubbles, uh, but uh, I think, I mean, I know that you've got ideas about all these issues, so I'll turn to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ron. So we'll try to get to some of those issues, including the role of the state. Uh, for our audience, uh, I know I've mentioned in the introduction that you could uh, put your questions by, by raising your hand. The production team tells me that you should actually be putting your questions in the chat. And uh, we will get into the moderated portion of the panel right now, but we'll try to leave as much time as possible to answer some of your questions. So uh, let's look at the first question for both Francesca and Ron. In our two previous events on the subject, uh, we've come to the conclusion that while Canada has some polarization and it doesn't have the level of political division that the US seems to have, but social divisions and intergroup conflicts persist. Why are not we not able to resolve some of these conflicts through one-on-one -on -one exchanges and dialogue? Francesca, do you wanna go first? Uh, yes, yes, sure. And, and thank you, Ron, for those terrific questions. I'll see if I can try to weave uh, some of what you asked in, into um, my response to the, the really interesting question um, Danielle posed. So in the United States, where we have just a, a tr scary, frightening level of political polarization, um, polarization in which not only do we disbelieve one another's facts, but we distrust one another, we dislike one another, we live in different places, we talk to different people, right? The level of political polarization uh, in the United States is an extreme and it is affective, emotional polarization. Um, and what I've been struck by in the last few years is that one of the common responses to that polarization is that we need to talk to one another across the partisan divide, as well as across divides of class, religion, race, ethnicity. If only we can bring people together, Democrats and Republicans, Trump supporters and opponents, Muslims and Christians, if only we can bring people together one-on-one -on -one to share stories, to empathize with one another's experiences, to begin to understand those differences, that that experience of, of intimacy, of something like friendship, will then spiral outward to create broader solidarities. And that in turn will help to diminish the levels of polarization. Now, when I hear those solutions, there's a lot to recommend them. But the first question I always have is, why doesn't the leader of the Democratic National Committee sit down with the leader of the Republican D National Committee and have a friendly conversation, trade stories, learn to empathize with one another, right? Why doesn't Sean Hannity, a notorious right-wing commentator, sit down with someone from a mainstream news uh, organ and talk about the norms of responsible political journalism. I fear that by vesting our hopes in ordinary conversations, uh, that we miss the ways in which the polarization that we have in the United States owes to institutions, owes to politics, owes to the media. Right? It's simply not clear to me how those individual conversations will spiral out will ripple outward into broader solidarities. Moreover, and this is something that I hadn't realized when I began studying these initiatives to bring people together for one-on-one -on -one conversation, 
there's a lot of evidence that suggests that talking to one another is not quite all that it's cracked up to be. Uh, research shows that if you ask someone to take the perspective of someone who fits a stereotype they have, their stereotypes are likely to be even more firmly held, right? They hunker down in those stereotypes. We know that people who are naturally empathetic tend to be more polarized in their political views. We know that it's much easier to feel empathy for people who are like you than people who are different from you. And so I'm suspicious of this easy faith in the power of individual encounters um, to change uh, a, a political landscape that is that owes to politics. Uh, Ron, as you said, to institutions, to politicians, and to collective memories. Um, so I would say, uh, again, that our sense of we-ness, our sense of identity must be in part imagined, right? As members of a nation, we can't know everyone. And so there has to be some sense that even though we don't know others, we're in this together. The question is then, what fosters that sense of we-ness? What fosters that sense of cooperation? Uh, Ron, as you suggested, we can you know, meet someone and begin to cooperate with them, but we often come to an interaction with ideas in our head about what this person is like, about what this encounter will be like. In the case of policing, about how police treat people like me. And so I would suggest simply that we need to think much more about the different ways in which our institutions, our government, um, our public servants, our popular culture, the ways in which our institutions communicate messages about who we are and what it is that joins us. I have much more to say. I'll stop there so I can give Ron a chance to jump in. Thank you, Francesca, but I'm going to go to Ron right after, but I'm just wondering, and you started to do this, so it can't be just individual conversations. There has to be some imagination. We have to transform the way we uh, develop cooperation on issues. You said, what foster it? Ron asked the question about the state. He asked the question about collective uh, memories. How important are these two things as the enablers to foster such an environment? A absolutely essential. Um, Roger Smith is a political scientist who has this wonderful term. He talks about our stories of peoplehood, right? In order for people, for citizens to cooperate, we need to have a sense of a shared story of peoplehood. I agree. But I think it's more complicated than that, right? First, because as Ron points out, we are not one single people, right? Canadians know that perhaps better than anyone. And the problem with the kind of standard narrative of an originating people, right? People who settled, people who conquered, people who discovered, is that it leaves out people who came later. Right. And we know I mentioned research suggesting that Americans who tend to see being American as being Anglo-Saxon, white, Protestant, have to tend to have very exclusive understandings of the nation and um, very narrow ideas of to whom resources should be made available. So the stories of peoplehood that we need to tell are multiple. Right. And part of the work, I think, of culture is working out how these multiple stories fit together, if they can be made to fit together. But the second point I would make, and this goes back to Ron's point about institutions, is that it's not just textbooks and speeches and holidays that communicate stories of peoplehood. It is also the everyday work of government, the policy making, the policy implementation. It's in that everyday machinery of government that government agencies are sending powerful message about 
who we are, right? who we're not, who is among us, who is outside the circle of the we. And so I would argue for really thinking a lot about the messages that, that policies uh, communicate about what it is that joins us. Thank you, Francesca. So Ron, from your research, how do we foster this cooperation? How do we transform the way we do things to make our democracies even more healthy and bright? Vibrant. Uh, so, you know, classic academic, then yeah, I'm going to duck and I'm saying, I'm going to say, I don't know how, but let me give you um, three data points, right? So I should have said when we started, right? So I work on um, kind of ideas about justice, right? And those ideas about justice are sometimes uh, you know, what we call everyday experience, which frankly, I think is a terrible term because every experience is everyday experience or lived experience, right? But what we call everyday experience, um, but also at the level of uh, within the bureaucracies, right? So just to give you a sense, I've been doing research, uh, as I mentioned, in some cities in the US with uh, tough relationships or difficult and violent relationships between uh, often minority residents, uh, often African-American, but not exclusively, and the police, um, but also with international bureaucracies, right, like the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and how it thinks about justice, right? Um, and so I think I've been moving within, within bureaucracies, within the state, let's call it, uh, and within sort of uh, everyday experience to think about how um, justice is thought about. And with that also some collective memory and a new project uh, in France that uh, Francesca has been helping me with actually to think about the memory of, um, uh, the collective memory of the Algerian Muslim community around violence of the 1960s. And so when you ask how uh, can the state do this? Um, you know, I think one has to be attentive to all of these three dimensions, right? As I mentioned earlier, at the level of policy, at the level of the past, and at the level of the state's own understanding of what is uh, just. So let me give you um, three data points to maybe give us a hint into the how, right? The first is that um, it's not only one-on-one -on -one relationships that matter, one-on-one -on -one people talking that matters, as you asked, Danielle, partly because people invest a huge amount of their um, understanding of themselves in their relationships, not only with each other, but their relationships to the state. Right? And what's been remarkable to us in the research we've been doing in Cleveland, let's say, is that no matter how often the state, and in this case policing, fails people, People, A, continue to call the police when they need them. That's not surprising. Uh, it's the only game in town, as I've said, right? Who else are you going to call in marginalized neighborhoods? But when they are asked how they make sense of doing so, it's apparent that they uh, that people in these neighborhoods, often people who have just been arrested, frankly, who we've been talking to, um, invest a huge amount of, uh, of a sense of recognition in the fact that they can call the state. Hmm? That the state is there for them and their inclusion as a citizen is their capacity to call on the state, even with the sense that that state agency will fail them. So why will talking one on one not uh, break intergroup conflict and social division is because people's sense of inclusion isn't only about the relationships with each other. It's also about the relationships with the state uh, and the degree to which that state uh, can or cannot uh, serve them. So I think that's one piece. The other is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, politicians' speeches, right? And so why won't one-on-one -on -one get there? Um, we did some work that came out in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences recently uh, on um, uh, in the U.S. on how people who uh, believed the, the narrative of America first Right. This is a populist narrative that suggests that uh, immigrants are bad, uh, in particular, in this case, Muslims are bad. Uh, international trade isn't so great, bad for America. Uh, Amer this is the MAGA, make America first, uh, uh, Trump Trumpism of the past several years. Right? We found that folks who believed that narrative, who held on to that narrative, uh, had uh, statistically lots of conflict with the state and law enforcement agencies as well, right? And that this wasn't true uh, for other populist narratives, a feeling like you had no say, uh, 
or feeling like elites had a better had a better world than you did, right? But there was something about what Francesca's calling a kind of a d idea about the nation that was exclusive, that was tapping into also past volatile relationships with the state. So that's really interesting, actually, right? That something about uh, a sense of exclusion, a sense of conflict with the state also leads people, or correlates at least, with people having a sense of uh, of America firstism as opposed to a sense of internationalism. The last thing I'll say is that I'm suspicious of this idea that more engagement leads to more kindness. Uh, and the reason I say this is, you know, someone in the chat um, I've noticed already has a question about uh, immigration, right? So some work we did in a Canadian city uh, that we don't name, but is just alongside Toronto and has a major international airport. Um, is, uh, work we did there demonstrated that support for redistribution, right, which we can think of as inclusion in many ways, right, support for welfareist policies is higher amongst first generation immigrants, a little lower amongst the one and a half generation a little lower amongst the second generation, and at its lowest, when you look at what we can call the third generation, right, which the literature sometimes calls, you know, uh, native born, right, but uh, basically support for broad re redistribution falls with immigration status. And so here, the question of uh, whether more interactions with fellow Canadians in this case, they had thought of as time and country, uh, leads to more support for redistribution, we find the opposite. Uh, the support for redistribution is highest amongst the most recent immigrants to Canada. So would one-on-one -on -one engagements include inclusion? I don't know. The state matters, memories matter, pasts matter, and it seems that uh, in immigration questions, time and country matters. Thank you, Ron, and, and I think where uh, both your interventions have taken us is, is going to uh, uh, lead me to the following question, and, and you mentioned, Francesca, in your initial introduction that uh, as much as the stories and the collective memories are important, the policies also are important. So are there strategies for governments to promote more inclusive understandings of national identity or belongings? And I want to thank our participants. We already have some questions that have been sent to us, and we'll get to some of these questions in a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Danielle. And yes, and, and I should say, I'm American, and I'm an expert on the United States. So I'm hoping to learn from you and, and from members of the audience about Canadian policies. But I, I am struck by the fact that um, so, so researchers, researchers have shown that cooperation depends on trust in institutions, right? A kind of generalized sense of trust. What the research has shown is that it's more important than people trust the agencies that are implementing policy than that they trust the agencies that are making policy. Right? And so this suggests that it is at the level of the everyday bureaucracies that people interact with, that that trust is really essential. So how do we create that sense of trust? And here, what was really striking to me about reading about uh, Canada's multiculturalism policy was not just the celebration of diversity, right? In the United States, we celebrate diversity too. It was the active, practical, daily, mundane government work that is required to accommodate differences. And I think that that work in figuring out when does a respect for religious freedom bump up against uh, uh, human right, gender rights, and so on? And how do we negotiate that difference? How do we figure out which minority group should have religious holidays recognized? That very kind of local and, um, and negotiated process of figuring out how we accommodate difference, I think is actually central to communicating a message about who we are as people who are different, but manage to live together in spite of those differences. 
a lot of the politics that we see, and I think this is true in Canada as well as in the United States, a lot of the politics we see is speech making, right? Is politicians talking about who we are, a grand nation and so on. What I would like us to see much more of is the negotiation that policy making involves. The work of figuring out how do we reconcile competing agendas? What can we give on? Um, after George Floyd's uh, death at the hands of police, um, there were huge protests around the world, as you know, and, and there was a lot of media coverage of the protests. What there was not coverage of, and I wish there had been, there was not coverage of a group of mayors sitting down to meet with Black Lives protesters, as well as other organizations, to figure out just what can we do to change policing. And so I think I would argue, I'm not sure what kinds of policies will do this work, but I think that the, the kinds of policies will are ones that emphasize the fact that democracy is this negotiation of differences in a very practical and daily and banal. Will Kimlicka uses the word banal. And I think I would use that term too in a banal way. In the United States, we don't have the experience of that the way I think Canadians do. It's, it's very interesting, Francesca, and what you said about the uh... The trust is as much as the delivery as the elaboration and the uh, the articulation of the policies is an interesting um, description given what we've gone through in Canada. I mean, from the pandemic standpoint, the public, you saw a rise in trust in public institutions go up because while it wasn't perfect, I think the public in general realized the importance of government and our government was trying to respond in an agile way to an unprecedented, like at least for generations, unprecedented crisis. And we're actually, what happened is when we were kind of heading back towards normality, if there's such a thing right now, um, we started, the government started to fail on basic delivery, passport services. Uh, immigration, airport clearances, and all of these things. And you saw that the gain that had happened during the pandemic, like step back, which is, I think is something very important for audience who are public servants is to say, the policies are important, but the, for the public to know that we are able to deliver these basic services, they are very important. Ron, on this notion of what are the policies that can actually promote a vibrant democracy? Meaningful engagement as what Francesca said, as opposed to the Vodafone speech writing. Yeah, I think um, I think it's just a brilliant question, and um, and I, I agree with Francesca uh, that it's the level of the of the implementation. Um, but I think it may even go, uh, you know, for everyday residents, it may go further even than implementation of the policy. It may go to the enactment of the policy, right? It, at the level of the individual. So I study policing. Um, and in places like Baltimore and Cleveland, uh, I'll tell you what people say. Um, you know, people want uh, to be treated fairly and equally and uh, in a just way. The, you know, the story that law tells of itself, right? The story of fairness, of, uh, of rights, of freedoms, of being treated uh, uh, equally to any other citizen in the nation. And people tell us this, right? They say, you know, don't treat me differently because I live here. Don't treat me differently um, because I'm Black in the cases of Baltimore and Cleveland in particular. Um, don't uh, don't make assumptions about us, right? There's a real uh, strong uh, need uh, expressed to us uh, by we've done. I should mention 200 interviews or so in the jails of Baltimore and Cleveland, and that's where these data come from. And um, people talk about this, and at the same time, and I'm going to say at the same time within person and across people, hmm? uh, people say, you know what? Acknowledge that we're in a different neighborhood than some other places you police. We're not the suburbs. Don't just treat us uh, as if you're ignorant about our circumstance, right? So there's an appetite, a need for the state to do inclusion work, to both treat people equally and fairly uh, in, in that sense, but also to defer to understand local community needs, to understand 
the appetite for difference, to understand that my challenges may be different than what you're used to seeing in other neighborhoods that you police, to giving me a break a little bit because my circumstances are different, right? And uh, these are not um, contradictory for people. People quite seamlessly hold uh, both of these hopes and aspirations for the state, right? Treat me fairly and treat me with empathy. Treat me justly and treat me with deference. Treat me through law and treat me through community, right? And uh, it's our capacity to navigate both those desires that people talk about when they say, live up to what you promised you'd do, but live up to something more too, right? So that's one piece. I'll add, and Danielle, I wasn't going to mention this, but you mentioned the sort of uh, the everyday work as well as the exceptionalism work, right? So we asked people in these cities, what does police professionalism look like to you? You could translate that question into what does good government look like to you? It was the same question, really, right? And folks told us four things, right? They said, listen, police have to be at least minimally competent, right? Get out of the cars, right? Don't just avoid us, show up on time, right? Minimal competence. They told us they should be ethical in their relationships with us, right? Treat us fairly, don't cheat, don't lie, right? This sort of thing. But they also told us two other things that I think might be interesting lessons for government. One is um, expand your domain. Don't just come and police us. Actually help us paint this house here at the corner. Help us with the kids who are on the streets, right? Help us do things that are outside of your remit because it shows that you believe in the place. And that's what a professional does, right? A professional takes care of the situation, right? That they worry about the whole context. And show us that you're willing to learn, right? Be reflexive about what you're doing. When people tell you that what you're doing isn't right, think about it, reflect, learn, and admit that you've learned. And those two might be interesting lessons uh, for thinking about government, as people told us this, as they thought about uh, what a police professional would be for them. Great. Thank you, Ron. It's very interesting. And we're now going to go to some of the questions from the audience. And um, uh, we, we spoke before the session, so we're going to try to keep our answers as brief as possible to try to entertain as many of the questions as possible. Francesca has a sharp uh, deadline. She teaches at noon, so we'll have to be done by noon. Um, the first question we have, and I'm going to go to Ron first, but I'm, I'm going to ask for Francesca's reaction, is what do you think of the future of populism in Canada? We've heard in previous election slogans like Brexit or separation of Quebec. Do you think the future of Canada will be a more polarized society or not? Uh, so I just to hear your views, Ron, as a, as a Canadian and somebody who does research on both sides of the border. But Francesca, from your research, I'd be interesting to uh, hear what you uh, would propose as advice to us Canadians on that issue. Go ahead, Ron. Um, yeah, so I can make a lot of money if I could tell the future. So I don't know about that. Uh, but um, I want to disentangle two things, actually. I want to disentangle the idea of populism uh, from the idea of polarization. Uh, populism historically and geographically comes from the right and from the left. Uh, populism, even in the context of the United States, where we, uh, I think all of our eyes were on for several years at least, um, even in the context of the United States, has different dimensions, right? Some of it may be a kind of America firstism, which has a long history in the United States, uh, a long and very dark history in the United States, uh, going back to the 30s. Um, and, but some of it may be a sense that people don't have a say and feel left out of politics. And those are very different pieces of a populist puzzle. Um, and some of which may be more divisive uh, than others. Some of which may lead to more social polarization than others. Uh, so as an individual, as a citizen of this country, I worry about the kinds of populism that Francesca was pointing to, which are about saying, I'm part of this nation and you are not, right? But we can imagine more diverse ideas about what populism is. So are we seeing more of that in Canada? Are we seeing more of a kind of um, who is included, who is not in the nation? That's what I would be uh, most attentive to uh, if I was in worrying, in, in asking about 
the question of social division. Um, I think uh, if there's a question about, you know, have the fruits of globalization, let's say, let's call it that, uh, been distributed equally across societies? Uh, I think the easy answer to that question is probably not. <laughs> uh, and if there is some uh, populism uh, that calls attention to that, I think that's a very different political moment or political worry than a populism that says uh, some of us belong and some of us do not. Uh, some of us um, are part of the genuine nation and some of us are not, right? And so I want to just disentangle those things. Um, but I'll turn to Francesca. Francesca? And particularly this, this notion of the globalization has not been as good for everyone is, has been very much at the heart, I think, of the, 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 the polarization we've seen in the U.S. I'm interested in your, your views on this. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, you know, when Donald Trump was first elected, um, the sort of standard sociological line was that the people who voted for Trump had been left out um, of, the, of globalization, mm -hmm. right? That they were economically marginalized, that their jobs uh, were less secure and so on. And then what subsequent studies showed that that wasn't in fact the case, that many of Trump's supporters had done very well, that they were their futures were not economically precarious. And that in fact, it was rather a sense that the United States had been left out of these globalization processes. And so people in one study, uh, fascinating by Rory McVeigh, people would talk about their own experience, but really they weren't talking about their own experience. They were talking about the fact that Americans had been left out, that white people were losing their power. So that sense of the I was intimately connected to the sense of the we. I would just make one other point about uh, populism in this country um, that I think because there are a lot of studies of populist beliefs that are individualistic, right? That ask what beliefs do people have who are populist or what beliefs do people have who are polarized? It's easy to miss the fact that polarization takes place and the rise of populism takes place in an institutional context. And so I think it's really important to realize that in the United States, for example, transformations in party politics over the last decade or two have been really important to understanding why there's been this level of polarization spurred by po uh, populist uh, beliefs and populist movements. The media, Right? I don't think Canada has something that's analogous to Fox News. And one of the important things about Fox News, one of the uh, reasons I think it played such a role in the rise of the populist right, is that populist uh, Fox News commentators did not just comment on news developments. They also told viewers how to interpret mainstream news stories. And so at the beginning of each show, um, news commentators would say, here's a story that appeared in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Here's why you should not believe it. Right? There was a kind of teaching going on, a kind of pedagogical function going on. And so one of the results, one of the consequences of that, I think, was that Americans came to distrust the mainstream media. Right? Uh, among Republicans, the levels of distrust of the mainstream media are in you know, the lowest they've ever been and far lower uh, than they've ever been. And so I would simply argue that in thinking about the rise of populism in Canada and what threat it poses, we think about the institutions uh, within which these political ideas um, gain traction, gain force, and are there ways in which we can structure our institutions so that, that, that there's more balance? If American journalists were able to maintain a kind of professional commitment to objectivity and balance, then we would have much less distrust of the media and much less political distrust more generally. We have yeah, a, can I, can yes, I go turn ahead, the Ron, tables, sure, of course. Yeah. Can I 
turn the tables on you. Um, I think of the of the three of us, um, I'm pretty sure you're the only one who's worked in government. And so I'd be curious to know from inside government um, how that very question is seen. Uh, the, question, the question of social fracture. Yeah, right? the, question, the, right? the question of social fracture is seen as uh, there is definitely been an erosion in uh, democratic institutions in Canada. I don't think we have the, the, the type of polarization we see in the US, but I think certainly uh, there is a strong sentiment that there has been, uh, that it is striking uh, the fourth pillar, which is a very important pillar, which is of course the media. Uh, the fact that uh, the new reality may be because of social media, may be because the trust factors, the fact that people tend to wish to read what they believe as opposed to read things that may actually influence their views, their thought, uh, make uh, the interaction between public policies, the government and the citizen, a much more difficult environment. Uh, I think it's, it's very critical. Um, like for example, I, I'm gonna bring an example on the national security side. Um, <clears throat> when the US election in foreign interference occur in 2016, um, we've been warning about the fact that the, the, the Russian could be uh, doing disinformation for, for some time. Uh, but uh, because we'd seen that what they had done in, in the context of the sports Olympics and the, the attack on, on the World Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, but interestingly, when this happened, there's nothing like a case study to awaken interest from you know, everyone, politicians, senior public servants and all of that. And, and the focus was all on the election. And many, many of us who have worked in various spheres of government in Canada said, we don't think that's the major threat in Canada. Our electoral system is very solid, very independent, very different than the US system. But we are quite worried about how a foreign interference campaign like what the Russians do, could do on polarizing the country on issues like West versus East, uh, Quebec identity issues, uh, these kinds of things. And, and I think that that's the challenge I think for the, the public uh, service right now is in the world where there's been an erosion of um, trust in public institutions, including in government, uh, how do you find ways to bring policies that foster the kind of cooperation that Francesca has been talking about in her initial speech when there seem to be a lot of barriers in having meaningful engagement? That would be my, uh, my take on that. It's really interesting. So I just want to turn to Francesca's point about um, context in a way, right? Uh, the field of the media, which I'm not at all an expert, um, seems to me uh, non-trivial here. Uh, the competitive dynamics in that field uh, of, of having to sell. <laughs> um, but also, so there's this recent article that came out just, I think last week, maybe two weeks ago, by uh, someone called Peter Tornberg in the Proceedings of the oh. National Academy where he shows, and I can't recall if it's Twitter or some other social media, where he shows that it's actually not the echo chamber that leads to polarization, uh, but it's being confronted with radically different views from what you're used to encountering. So actually we all encounter different views every day, but it's within a certain confidence interval, right? Somewhat different views from mine, right? But actually through social media, when it's not so much that I'm only hearing myself, but I'm hearing views that are, to me, just outlandish. And actually, they appear to have a lot of people who agree with them, right? And that, um, uh, the Tornberg article is suggesting, is what leads to the kind of polarization, more so than the echo chamber, right? It's being confronted with radically diverse views uh, that appear to have some stability, right? So getting our hands on this very question, Danielle, of, uh, of to what extent is it about to the media, the sort of the corporate media, like the, the institutional media, the social media, the bubble versus the radical difference, I think is so core to what Francesca is talking about and our capacity to cooperate. Yeah. If That's I could step. just jump, sorry, can I just yeah. jump into yeah, that? Because yeah. I think it, it, it's such an important point. Um, Christopher Bale is an American sociologist who has also shown that exposing people to competing views in online media tends to increase 
polarization rather than decrease it, right? That was always the democratic hope that when we're exposed to views that are different from ours, we rethink our own opinions, we recognize compromises we might not have seen, we recognize alternatives we might not have seen. That's no longer the case. But I also want to recall that when I grew up reading a newspaper, I knew that the most important piece of news was in the upper right-hand corner, right? I could count on the editor telling me as a member of the public, this is the news that you need to pay attention to be, to, to be a well-informed member of the public. Now, there are all kinds of problems with that, right? What is most important in the view of the editor is not necessarily what is most important. But there were certain shared habits of determining what news we need to pay attention to, what news we should trust, right? And that one of the effects of social media is that we lack that, there's not that guidance, right? The news that we're exposed to is the news we've said we've liked before. The news that we're exposed to is the news that we're likely to click on the headline because it's provocative. And so that in turn shapes the kinds of discussions that we have. Uh, as a nation, the kinds of deliberations, the kinds of opinion sharing uh, that we engage in. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And Ron, I must say, I, I, I enjoyed the, what you said about how the uh, reading on a, a number of volumes of, of comments that actually infuriate you, make you even more, uh, because I, I my reaction as an older person to uh, social media, particularly Twitter, when I look at it is, I feel it's like the good old church porch when I grew up, with both the potential to communicate very important information to a number of people, but can also become the forum for some of the worst of human being uh, tragedies, uh, gossips. Uh, and and, and it, it, it's interesting, but what you're basically saying is people by being exposed in the digital world where scale, it's scale, right, uh, becomes even more uh, not willing to listen. So that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, Francesca, we have an interesting question because you, you talk about, you know, how the fact that open migration in Canada as as um, you know, may have created right conditions for corporations and all of that in your in your talk. But uh, there's one of our participants in the audience who also says sometimes the immigrants come from different places where countries may be at odds, where there may be conflicts between what they are living here versus what what's happening. I mean, we see some of that here sometimes in the Chinese diaspora between people who may have come from Hong Kong who are much more critical on what's happening on the mainland than maybe people who've come from the mainland. Uh, your views on that, uh, how, how this, does this impact cooperation? I, I think that's exactly why it is important to develop a sense of the we, of the national we, right? And, and I would argue that certainly Canada has not been completely successful in doing it, but I think you've done it better than we have done which is to develop a sense of the we that encompasses differences among the, the groups that make it up, right? To tell a story of peoplehood that is not just a kind of combination of all the stories of the people who have come here uh, with their conflicts, but that tries to integrate those uh, stories into one of what it is to be Canadian. Um, and so I think that, that that task is just really essential. It's a cultural task, but as we've been suggesting, it's a political task too. Ross? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just add to that, that it's, it's a political task, but it's not a partisan task, or it need not be a partisan task. And so that very article I was mentioning, uh, talking about um, internationalism and how it taps into how anti-internationalism and anti-immigration taps into un underlying volatility uh, that we found empirically um, turns out not to be predicted at all by whether you voted for Trump or not 
that actually didn't tap into, as Francesca was saying, didn't tap into any underlying volatility. And other aspirations for the nation that were about uh, change and populist change, as people were calling in questions, uh, didn't tap into the volatility. What tapped into the volatility that we found uh, was when people thought, I belonged and you didn't, uh, that immigrants didn't belong, and that internationalism as such uh, was bad for the nation, right? That engaging outside the borders of the nation was itself bad. Um, that was what tapped into volatility. So the fact that we found no partisan differences actually by voting patterns for this tells me what Francesca says, which is stories uh, about inclusion need not uh, be partisan in fact, aren't empirically partisan, uh, but that they, they uh, but when that they are, sorry, but when they're exclusionary, they take on a, a different, um, uh, well, when they're exclusionary, they're exclusionary. I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, when they're exclusionary, they say, I belong and you don't. And that that appears to tap into earlier frustrations with the nation. Good. Our, our panelists are so good that they've actually managed to answer two questions we had received uh, from participants in the chat. The one about the possibility of the, the tensions where you come from, your state and all of that. But we also had one about if you focus too much on the, the different differences, is it not gonna be div divisive? And, and what I'm hearing from the two of you is it has to be respecting differences, but not making it an exclusive thing. You have to build the we as, as, as what the, Francesca described, correct? Then yeah, can I uh, intervene and maybe Francesca, yeah. uh, so I'm dying to know Francesca's answer to this actually, yeah. because I'm starting to work on France, right? And this is ex this is like the, the, the crucible for this question, right? We have histories of uh, ethnocultural communities in France or who were French, of course, they were colonized. So the, the Algerian community, let's say, uh, in France. Um, and we have a story uh, and a narrative, uh, a state narrative about laïcité, uh, sort of a secularism that is a republicanism, which everyone is uh, is a member of the state and uh, and we don't see color or difference in that sense. Okay, we could talk about the, the French uh, story there, the French account of itself. Um, you know, Danielle, you're saying respectful of difference, right? But of course, the Republican story in France is that the way to be respectful of difference is precisely different uh, than, let's say, the Canadian narrative of multiculturalism. That laïcité is the way to manage difference by creating uh, a single collectivity. Um, I'm really interested in that because I think it, it, it has to negotiate cult cultural and collective memories at once. But I'd be curious to know uh, from you and from Francesca, actually, what uh, what your views are on that mode of doing difference looks like. Francesca? Um, yes, it, 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 it's a terrific question. And I, I noticed that a participant had asked something like, what's wrong with seeing your country as number one, mm -hmm. right? Nothing at all. Right. And so in this vein, scholars sometimes distinguish between patriotism, which is a love of nation, and what they call chauvinism, which is a love of nation, but also um, a tendency to be exclusive, to see other nations as inferior, to resist any kind of collaboration or cooperation. Now, it's really hard to draw the line, right? What is patriotism is, and what is chauvinism? And as Danielle said, the, 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 you know, the $64,000 question is, how do you maintain that sense of unity while being respectful of difference? What I would suggest only is that we emphasize less who is in and who is out. We emphasize less the boundaries Right? Because certainly we can't let everyone in. Right? We can't treat everyone as being an equal member of the polity. But that we focus less on the boundaries di distinguishing who is in and who is out and more on how we are joined, what the character of our bonds are. And in that respect, and again, I'll suggest you're, you're probably sick of me hearing this and you may disagree, but I think that what Canada does better than France is to put forefront the work of negotiation, 
the daily political work that is necessary to accommodate differences, right? As opposed to what I understand to be the French solution, which is to say, we have this idea of what it is to be French and it trumps um, other understandings of what Frenchness is. It's that showing the um, work of negotiation and that that is what democracy is. I think that's a powerful way to to respond to that challenge. That's a that's that's a very very good point, Francesca. And to go back to your question, if you try to ask it to me, around, um, I would say that look, listening to both of you today, and looking at your question, if I were to answer as a Quebecer who lives in Ottawa area, so read both francophone and anglophone press. Uh, I'm always struck at how the English media in general in Canada misunderstand the whole lessicity debate in, in Quebec. It has a lot less to do, and I don't, don't necessarily agree with all the policies that have been enacted, so let's make it clear now, like the religious symbols, and I don't necessarily agree with all of that. But what I'm struck when I read mainstream newspapers in Canada describing what's happening in Quebec is how much they've don't understand what you refer as collective memories of Quebecers, which is being raised under the umbrella, very tight umbrella of the Catholic Church, uh, being told you shouldn't go into business because you know this is like the Protestants that do that. Uh, you should, and and there's a, a a a huge societal reaction to no, we don't think it's that you know we should have an identity that is not based on religious. Thing. We should be able to based on, on language, on culture, on trying to live together. Uh, it, it's a, it remains a society very open to migration, but with some uh, um, some some concerns on the impact that uh, religion can have on the on the, the public place. And and I'm always and I have this conversation with a lot of migrants, our friends, and it's interesting. All few of them understand the history of Quebec through the lens of we were under the ropes of the Catholic Church for so long and, and with very little liberty, right? So, um, yeah, I'll just um, add yeah. to that. I, I'm always surprised by the um, the thin understanding uh, uh, Anglophone Canada has often of French policies of lazy did, right? Yeah. Uh, which are also um, uh, ignore uh, th those moments. Um, I'll just add, sort of, it's it's interesting to have this conversation, the three of us, uh, uh, sort of as a personal, just to put the personal on the table. Um, the only one in my family, uh, my nuclear family, to have been born in Canada, a family of uh, uh, Egyptian Egyptian uh, origin. Both my parents had been born in Egypt. We spoke uh, French, Arabic, uh, Hebrew, and English at home. And my whole story, my whole lived experience, as we say, is a it came through Quebec's policies uh, around um, around around its nationhood and around uh, around thinking about uh at the time what was bill 101 and, and later so so danielle these stories uh also hit home very personally often um as part of one's own individual trajectory that matches collective stories uh we have a question here that gets to the the role of the state and and the fact that uh, state may have different uh, political systems at play it says on Francesco's and Ron's point about the institutional role in fostering national identity and perhaps tampering polarization, at least in Canada, I wonder if this could be extended to the difference of government systems that we have. Even just having two party in the US versus now multi party in Canada. Your views on that? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, to, to the, the point about the power of institutions, um, that it is very difficult to see in the United States how we can have compromises, how we can have actually the kind of policy that the majority of Americans want. Americans want um, some restrictions on gun ownership, but in a Congress that is divided and in a political system in which primaries, the use of the filibuster, other norms uh, of doing the work of politics 
point uh, in the direction of polarization and the benefits, the advantages, the incentives to polarization, it's very hard to see how we will be able to have the kinds of compromises that would allow American citizens who do agree on some things to get the policies they want. Lots? I don't have a lot to add to that. Um... Uh, I didn't know how to answer. Francesca answered in ways that I find very convincing. Um, I'll say, you know, there are countries that are other at the other extreme of that distribution. So a country like Israel, um, where all governments are made through coalition, uh, may be an interesting comparison case, right, where political compromise is always on the table. And then the question is, uh, does that political compromise pull uh, in which directions does that political compromise have to pull in order to get enough seats uh, to govern? So I, it's not an answer so much as just a reaction to what I thought was very convincing by Francesca. Okay, and we're going to go for a last question from the audience before uh, bringing the session to, to a wrap. Um, how do we account for the rise of a more ethnic and exclusionary sense of Canadian identity? Is it due to the influence of national ideologies from other countries, perhaps more notably American perspective and belief, but yet we see populism in many, many other countries in the US? Um, I, I'll just, I'll, I guess I just say two things. One is that I think when researchers interview people about how they understand who they are and what their nation is, what they find is a kind of remarkable diversity of views that the same person may talk about what being Canadian is or what being American is in very different ways, in ways that are more civic, in ways that are more ethnic. And so to me, that points, that, that sort of diversity of views suggests not that we're irrational or incoherent, but that by priming some of those beliefs, by, by emphasizing, by reminding us that yes, we are a nation of immigrants or by reminding us of our civic uh, national identity, we can encourage people to emphasize that part of themselves. Um, so yes, I think that, that we see both conceptions in most people. And um, on the issue of what accounts for the rise of more ethnic conceptions of identity, one of the things I find striking in, in survey research is that Canada is not a country that sees immigration as a crisis. Um, European countries do. Uh, Americans do, and that it's not just a perception of what challenges face your nation, but whether they rise to the level of crisis, that that really affects the ways in which you think about who should be within the circle of the way. And again, then we need to pay attention to the role of politicians and the media in defining what challenges rise to the level of a crisis. Thank you. Ron? Uh, yeah, so so it's a good question um, whether empirically we have a more sort of exclusionary sense of Canadian identity uh, than we have in the past. I, it'd be interesting to know how to track that. I mean, it's, an, it's, it's a very interesting question. I will say that even if we were to, let's just take for granted that maybe we do, um, there's still a question of national styles that matter, right? Uh, and so it how should I say this? Um, it may be that exclusionary politics are on the rise everywhere, in some countries, in Canada, in the US, but they may take on very different flavors, right? And that those flavors may matter. So when COVID-19 began, uh, a student and I did some work, actually a colleague and I now did some work on how border uh, closures were being talked about, because of course, most countries had engaged in border closures at the same time, right? And we found that in the US, border closures were justified uh, under some justifications. And in Canada, the same policies were justified differently, right? Uh, in Canada, the focus was often on expertise, on science. Uh, in the US context, uh, it, was, it was based on a we that had to be isolated from the outside. And so we were able to track this in some speeches. 
There you have the same policy justified very differently. And that justification, um, you can say it's just symbolic, but I would say it's precisely symbolic, actually. It's precisely those justifications that communicate to the polity why these policies are being enacted, and they tell a story in Francesca's terms about who we are and why we enact some ways of acting and some political decisions and not others. So I guess I would, in thinking about whether we are more exclusionary or not, I would also think about A, the material outcome, maybe, but B, the justification and the story about it, which may be very different uh, and which may tap into different senses of the nation and may tap into different possibilities for solidarity uh, within the country as well. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Francesca. It's been a very interesting conversation uh, for, we had an audience of several hundred participants today and for this audience of public servants, I think having this reflection on what foster cooperation, what can make our democracies even more vibrant? How do we create the condition for a uh, meaningful engagement uh, with uh, the public, with Canadians? Uh, both through the elaboration of our policies, but as we also said, the actual delivery of these policies is also very important, is so critical. So I'm really grateful on behalf of the Canadian School of Public Service for the time that you've uh, extended to us today. Francesca, you're going to be right on time for your seminar. Ron, it's good to see you. Uh, big, big thank you to you. Big thank you to the audience as well. I want to remind you that the next session of the Future of Democracy series will be the fourth event the seven seas of policing and will be held on November 24th, 2022. So November 24th and I encourage them to check the CSPS, the Canadian School of Public Service website for more information. And since it's gonna be on policing, I would say Ron is giving you a good uh, appetizer for that next session. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Bonjour, bonne journée. Thank you, have a great day. <laughs>